Morning at the Window by T. S. Eliot. They are rattling breakfast plates in basement kitchens, and along the trampled edges of the street I am aware of the damp souls of handmaids sprouting despondently at area gates. The brown waves of fog toss up to me, twisted faces from the bottom of the street, and tear from a passerby with muddy skirts, an aimless smile that hovers in the air and vanishes along the level of the roofs. The Boston Evening Transcript the readers of the Boston Evening Transcript sway in the wind like a field of ripe corn, when evening quickens faintly in the street, wakening the appetites of life in some, and to others bringing the Boston Evening Transcript, I mount the steps and ring the bell, turning wearily as one would turn to nod goodbye to Russian Fakoy. If the street were time and he had at the end of the street, and I say, Cousin Harriet, here is the Boston Evening Transcript. Aunt Helen Miss Helen Sligsby was my maiden aunt and lived in a small house near a fashionable square, cared for by servants to the number of four, now when she died there was silence in heaven, and silence at the end of the street. The shutters were drawn and the undertaker wiped his feet. He was aware that this sort of thing had occurred before. The dogs were handsomely provided for, but shortly afterwards the parrot died too. The Dresden clock continued tick-ticking on the mantelpiece, and the footman sat upon the dining table, holding the second housemaid on his knees, who had always been so careful while her mistress lived. Cousin Nancy Miss Nancy Ellicott strode across the hills and broke them, rode across the hills and broke them, the barren New England hills, riding to hounds over the cow pasture. Miss Nancy Ellicott smoked and danced all the modern dances, and her aunts were not quite sure how they felt about it, but they knew, knew that it was modern. Upon the glazen shelves kept watch, Matthew and Waldo, guardians of the faith, the army of unalterable law. Mr. Apollonax When Mr. Apollonax visited the United States, his laughter tinkled among the teacups. I thought of Fragilon, that shy figure among the birch trees, and of Priapus in the shrubbery, gaping at the lady in the swing. In the palace of Mr. Flackerset, Professor Channing Cheaters, he laughed like an irresponsible fetus. His laughter was submarine and profound, like the old man of the seas, hidden under coral islands where worried bodies of drowned men drift down in the green silence. Dropping from fingers of surf, I looked for the head of Mr. Apollonax rolling under a chair, or grinning over a screen with seaweed in its hair. I heard the beat of Centaur's hoofs over the hard turf as his dry and passionate talk devoured the afternoon. <sighs> he is a charming man, but after all, what did he mean? He has pointed ears. He must be unbalanced. There was something he said that I might have challenged. Of Dowager, Mrs. Flaccus, and Professor and Mrs. Cheetah, I remember a slice of lemon and a bitten macaroon.
conversation gallant. I observe our sentimental friend the moon, or possibly fantastic, I confess, it may be Prester John's balloon, or an old battered lantern hung aloft to light poor travellers to their distress. She then, how you digress, and I then, Someone frames upon the keys that exquisite nocturne with which we explain the night and moonshine, music which we seize to body forth our own vacuity. She then, does this refer to me? Oh no, it is I who am inane. You, madam, are the eternal humorist, the eternal enemy of the absolute giving our vagrant moods the slightest twist. With your air indifferent and imperious, at a stroke our mad poetics to confute. And are we then so serious? La figla chepiange O quam di memoriam vergo. Stand on the highest pavement of the stair, lean on a garden urn, weave, weave the sunlight in your hair, clasp your flowers to you with a pain surprise, fling them to the ground and turn with a fugitive resentment in your eyes, but weave, weave the sunlight in your hair. So I would have had him leave, so I would have had her stand and grieve, so he would have left, as the soul leaves the body torn and bruised, as the mind deserts the body it has used. I should find some way incomparably light and deft, some way we both should understand, simple and faithless as a smile and shake of the hand. She turned away, but with the autumn weather, compelled by imagination, many days, many days and many hours. Her hair over her arms and her arms full of flowers, and I wonder how they should have been together. I should have lost a gesture and a pose. Sometimes these cogitations still amaze the troubled midnight and the noon's repose. 